Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. Lord Jesus, we so long for that day where we can sing endless praise, Lord. Lord, together with the elders and the thousands upon thousands and millions of angels, just be singing your praise forevermore, Lord. Lord, thank you also that we don't have to wait for that day, that we can start right now, God. With our lives and with our mouths, with our breath, that we can sing and proclaim your praise because, Jesus, you are worthy. You are glorious and majestic. You are so faithful and you are so good, Lord. And so this morning, God, we want to make that our song. Maybe just as you're standing or sitting wherever you are, in your own words, don't you want to take a moment or two and just lift up your praise and your thanksgiving to Jesus? So Jesus, our Lord and our God, this morning we just lift you up over all. Lord, over our hearts and our feelings, over our emotions, over our struggles and over our victories, over our challenges, Lord, and over our hopes, over our dreams, and over our disappointments. And we say, come what may, you are our Lord and our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, band. Really, really appreciate you guys. And such a joy, as I said earlier, just to be able to share this crazily special day with, with all of us together and to be able to spend some time in the Word to read some Scripture today. And, you know, as I was preparing, I had to, you know, chop out quite a, a lot of what I had prepared because kind of I think I prepared like a six-month Bible school course and... This morning, just for us to, to take a few moments and to stand still around what's become known to us in sort of modern world as Easter, perhaps more accurately Passover, and specifically the, the Passover, the final Passover, the real, if I can call it that, Passover. And so we're going to read a, a number of, of chapters, large sections of Scripture from, you could have taken Matthew, Mark, I think already. Um, Carl helped me a little bit, and he had a set of Luke. We could have taken John, and they all tell the same story from a, just a little bit of a different angle and different nuances, but it's the same story. And I've taken Matthew just for no other reason than it's the first book in the New Testament, and just the one that I happened to read first in my preparation. And we pick up the story where Jesus' ministry is really flourishing. Jesus, from a purely human point of view, his life is happening. Wherever he goes, there are multitudes following him, thousands upon thousands of people, the like of which had not really been seen before in his day. Miracles are happening. People, I mean, they are like 5,000 men, not counting the women and children one day, and they've got five loaves of bread and two little fish, like basically a kid's lunchbox, and he feeds them all with this. Sick people are being healed and leprous people are being restored. Deaf people can hear. There are even a, a couple of cases where dead people are, are made alive again. And as Jesus is carrying on, he's sharing his stories, he's bringing this teaching, there's these signs and wonders, and, and his life is happening. Everywhere he's going, and it seems in a completely natural sense to be going well. Sinners are welcoming him into their own their homes. This one man, Zacchaeus, he's sitting up in a tree. He's quite a wealthy guy, but he's a short guy. And so he climbs up in a tree and Jesus walks past and he says, Zacchaeus climbs down 
Zacchaeus, I see, I guess I see you. you can get down from the tree. And he, he gets down from the tree and Jesus goes and sits in Zacchaeus' big house and he has his grand meal together with all the influential people of the city. A lady comes up and she brings this jug of perfume, very, very expensive oil. You're worth about a year's wages. So take your salary of a year. That's what this is worth. And she comes and pours it out at his feet. And this is just the life in a sense that Jesus is living. And I can imagine if, if you're on the outside watching this, you're thinking whether I agree with this guy or not, whether I think he's real or whether he's a fraud, he's doing well for himself. It seems to be going well. And yet as he's going through this on the inside, he knows things are about to change. And so it brings us to this fateful day, which has for us come to be known as Good Friday. I've sort of labeled it a very bad Friday, if you want to use that. Because I want us to read through the story a little bit through the eyes of a human Jesus. Yes, Jesus was God, but he was also human. And so I want us to read this and try and put ourselves in the shoes of Jesus. As a man. And so on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, so what's actually happening is there's sort of three feasts that are converging at this time. There's Passover, there's the festival of the unleavened bread, there's a Sabbath involved as well. There's the first of four, the feast of first fruits. They all come together at this time. And so on the preparation day, these disciples, the first of the day before the Passover, and they come and they say to Jesus, where do you want us to prepare this meal? That we're going to have together. Jesus says, as you go into the city, you will see a certain man. And I think it's in the John text that tells us it wasn't just a certain man. He had already prepared the whole room. Everything was ready. This guy knew that something was going to happen. And Jesus sends this team to him and says, tell them. The teacher says, my time has come. I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them. And they prepare the Passover meal there when it was evening. So for the purposes sort of of our illustration, I don't think theologically it really makes any difference at all. But um, I'm going to just allow us just to pop across into a different culture, the Hebrew culture, which sees day and night very different to the way we see day and night. For most of us, today started when we woke up this morning. Or perhaps technically, today started one second past midnight or at midnight or whatever it was. That's when the day started. In the Jewish culture, it would have been different. The day starts at sunset and finishes at the next sunset. So it's evening first and then day. Does that sort of make sense for us? It doesn't quite work like that. But in the Jewish culture, and this is written a little bit from the Jewish background. So when it was evening, so it has just started. Friday has just begun. It was evening. Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve, and he's going to have this Passover meal, which is a ceremonial meal. It refers back to the time when Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt. And um, as I said, I prepared like a six-month Bible school series for us here. Yeah. Don't have time to get into all of that. All of that was actually just a prophetic picture of what's about to happen the next day, but Jesus sits down with his disciples and he goes through the ceremonial ritual with them. They sit together. They have this meal. This is also the meal where he washes their feet. And then he begins to share some things with them. And one of the things that he shares this evening, Jesus sits down at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he says, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. So once again, let's forget just for a moment that Jesus is God. Let's remember for a moment that Jesus is a man sitting in a sense what probably is the equivalent of in our modern culture of our Christmas dinner. You're sitting with all of your friends, your family, the special people in your life, and you look at them. And you say, one of you guys is going to stab me in the back. We jump forward a couple of verses to verse 26. As they were eating... Jesus took some bread. We're going to do this a little bit later. This is sort of a, the high point 
of this meal, of this ceremony, this ritual to remember everything that had happened with the Egyptians and Israel. Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it. And then he said something they'd never heard before, for this is my body. Up to then, it had always represented the sacrifice, the manna, the brokenness. It had represented um, sort of the lamb that was slain way back. And he says, do this now for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood. And they would have associated it up to that moment with the blood of a lamb that was painted on the doorposts to save them from destruction back in Egypt. And it confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out, poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn. And they went out to the Mount of Olives. And they had been doing this for quite a while, this whole week. Every night they'd gone out to the Mount of Olives. It looks like they probably spent the night up in the mountain for the last couple of months, or the last couple of that week at least. And on the way, Jesus told them, tonight, one of you will betray me. He said that already. All of you will desert me. For the scripture says God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Verse 33, just a couple of verses later, Peter says, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. His best friend, one of his best friends at least, says, I'm always going to be there. So here's Jesus going through this day. This, this day hasn't started too badly it actually started pretty well. They have a nice dinner, and then kind of he starts saying, one of you guys, you're going to stab me in the back. And then he says, this is my blood is about to be poured out. They don't quite get what he's saying there. And then he's got all of his friends around him and says, not one of you are going to stick with me tonight. And then Peter says, no, but even if everyone else deserts you, I'm never going to desert you. Jesus said, Peter, I tell you that, or I'll tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, in other words, before tomorrow morning, you'll deny three times that you know me. No, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. All the other disciples vowed the same. And so here's Jesus, and his friends are making empty promises to him. And this day is just about to get a lot worse. So he took them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And so this emotional burden that he has been carrying just becomes too much. Some of the other texts, I think the John passage as well, Luke 1 says that his sweat became like great blood, great drops of blood. Many people believe he was actually he was going through such intense stress that he actually was blood that was sweating from him because of the emotional turmoil that he was under and that he was going through. He went a little farther. So he's, he said, you guys stay here and just, just help me. He went a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. But I nevertheless, kind of, I want your will to be done, not mine. And so here's Jesus in this emotional turmoil, wrestling with the Father. Wrestling about, in a sense, what's good for him as a human and what's good for the Father. He says, save me this pain I'm going through and I'm about to go through. I'm, there's so much that's ahead of me. I don't quite know how I'm going to be able to get through this. If there's any way to change this, then change this. But also, God, I want to do your way. And so he's wrestling with the Father to the point of surrender. Then he returns to his disciples and he finds them asleep. He says to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and he prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away 
unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. He's going through this intense anguish. He's about to be betrayed. He's already told them that, hey, guys, I know you're going to desert me. And right here, they're not even supporting him. He's in the natural all by himself, alone. Doesn't have anybody around him. He's going through this anguish. He's, in a sense, sweating blood. He's got his best buds. He says, guys, just hold my hand in a figurative sense. Just watch my back. And the best they can do is fall asleep. A couple of verses later, he actually, I think I chopped that piece out, but he comes to them and he says, guys, sleep later. Stand up now. We're not going to, there isn't time to sleep because look, my betrayer is at hand. And even as Jesus said that his betrayer is at hand, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and the elders of the people. Can I just remind us, this is late at night. After a long day, late at night, the traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. He will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Jesus came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and he gave him the kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. And so this evening is escalating. Jesus says someone is going to betray him. Here he gets betrayed. He says his friends aren't going to support him. They don't support him, and he ends up getting arrested. I want you just for a moment, we're trying to get into those shoes. How do we feel in those moments when we know, we've heard somebody tell us that somebody of our best friends is about to go to the police with a false accusation? Not only go to the police, but help the police to arrest us. All of the rest of my buddies, none of them are going to be there. And the police come and they arrest Jesus late at night. Throw him in the back of what the Rifang Vans at all, you know, the bread wagon. Take him away. That's exactly the situation where Jesus finds himself in. And if we're looking at Friday having started at sunset, the day has just begun. For most of us, that would be the worst day of our life if it were to end here. For Jesus, this day. It's just getting started. So they take him to a place where they start making a bunch of accusations against him, the high priest's house. We jump forward to verse 55. So I'm jumping a whole bunch of, of texts here just because I want us just to be able to get to this, the parts that specifically look at, at Jesus and his experience in this day. I'd encourage you to maybe today or tomorrow read through the whole chapter and fill in the blanks that I'm skipping over. But Jesus says to this crowd, am I some dangerous, oh sorry, he hasn't been taken away yet. He's still in Gethsemane. He, someone's ears has just been chopped off. Peter chopped off a guy's ear. Peter, Jesus took the ear, picked the ear up, put it back. I would love, to, I want to just go back to that moment. I'm busy arresting someone. His friend chops off my ear. The guy I'm arresting picks up my ear, puts it back. And I carry on arresting him. That's just a weird moment. But anyway, there's just so much stuff in the script. They come to him, and the John passage says this so clearly that it's not in the rest of the text. But they come to Jesus, and they say, we are looking for the Messiah. Jesus says, I am he. Now, there's this large gathering of people who've all come to arrest him. As he says, I am he, do you know what happens? They all suddenly fall to the ground. Like a matrix moment. I'm like, how do you get up from that and still go and arrest him? But they do. Anyway, there's this craziness that's all hidden within these stories. Go and read them. He says, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I'm there every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. 
Now he is alone. There is not one person supporting him, encouraging him, saying, I'm here with you. They all said, I promise you I will always be there. <laughs> Gone like the wind. Then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him. Now, can I just also say, this is meant to be the holiest night on their calendar. As a matter of fact, I didn't read this, but at the start of Matthew 26, they planning to arrest Jesus, but they said not during the Passover because we don't want to create a riot in the Passover. And what did they end up doing? They end up arresting him on the very first day of Passover. Anyway, so at least Potter's, Peter follows him at a distance and he comes to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and sat with the guards and waited to see how it will all end. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they can put him to death. So here he is, arrested. The people who arrested him don't even have charges against him yet. They're just getting people, finding people who would be willing to lie, to tell some story against Jesus so that we can have some sort of case because we want to kill him. Even though they found many who agreed to give false witness, so there were a bunch of people who were willing to, they realized they couldn't use anyone's testimony because there'd be too many holes in all of the testimonies. But finally, two men came forward who declared, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, you have said it. And in the future you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror. And he said, blasphemy, why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What's your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die. And so in this moment, Jesus is condemned to death by a mob. No trial, no facts, just a mob shouting out like in the Roman movies of the time. The Roman movies depicting sort of this, the time around Jesus. Just a mob shouting, kill him, kill him. He must die. And in this moment, he's in a sense condemned to death already. There's still some one or two um, processes that need to take place because there was a form of rule. There was a form of justice that needed kind of the steps that needed to go through. But the mob has decided this man is going to die. As we're thinking about Jesus, I maybe want to pause here for a moment and put ourselves not only in Jesus' shoes, but ask ourselves, have we been in moments like this? When was the last time I was a moment, in a moment where I was falsely accused? Where I felt I'd been deserted by the people who'd promised they would be around me? Where somebody closest to me stuck a knife in my back? Perhaps you've been in a moment like that. That's exactly where Jesus is. Then they began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him. He's physically abused and taunted. If I can say, fortunately, if that's the right word, not something which we see very much in our lives today. Maybe sort of at, at school, there's some experiences like this where perhaps some of us were physically abused and taunted. Sometimes it feels like we're being abused and we're being taunted. We find ourselves in situations where there is no way out and the people around us are sort of meant to be supporting us. They've left the rest of the people. They're pointing fingers. They're bringing accusations. We're really finding ourselves in a rough spot. 
very early in the morning. So this is now past midnight already, but sun isn't up yet. The leading priests and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him and led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked him, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. The court, those who are meant to bring justice, can look at the situation and identify that Jesus is innocent in the situation. He's been arrested. Maybe in our workplace, you've been isolated. Your job, they're pointing fingers on, at you out of envy. You're being accused. You're not being promoted. You may be being demoted. People are just saying things. Nasty things about you, and it's out of envy. And those who are meant to be able to bring justice on the outside, they can see that. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. The man who is meant to be impartial receives a warning from his wife saying, this guy is innocent. Leave him alone. Maybe the evidence in your situation, big or small, is I'm not the guilty one here. Maybe even you know the evidence is at the judge, the court, the arbiter, the boss, the friend, the whoever it is, they need to make this decision. They're meant to be the impartial one and Meanwhile, the leading priests, the elders, persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked, which of these two do you want me, which of these two do you want me to release to you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas. See, this conspiracy is now growing. Now it's not just the chiefs and the high priests. They're now getting all of the crowds against Jesus. There's this massive conspiracy To blame him, there's this notorious criminal. Most people believe he was a murderer. He was not a popular man, Barabbas. Pilate was sort of looking for an easy way out when he said Barabbas or Jesus. Because in his mind, they've just arrested this Jesus out of envy. There is this Barabbas who is an evil person that no one wants around. This is slam dunk. It's going to get me out of the situation. So you guys can pick one. And they picked the one he didn't think they were going to pick. There's this massive conspiracy that's brewing against Jesus. So Pilate responds, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. They're not coming with more evidence They're not coming with a better argument. They're not coming with a stronger case against Jesus. It's just a mob shouting louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. Do you remember they said they don't want to arrest Jesus during the Passover because they don't want the riot? It's exactly what's happening. So he sent for a bowl of water, washed his hands, Before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip and then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The arbiter of justice who knows that Jesus is innocent, hands him over unjustly. Don't know if anyone have ever felt that we've been treated unjustly, that we were handed over when we shouldn't have been, when somebody should have been there to protect us, 
and they didn't. Somebody who knew the truth just needed to put their hand up and put their foot down and say no. Jesus is exactly in that situation where Pilate doesn't do that. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. They placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. They knelt before him in mockery and taunted him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and stuck him on the head with it. When they were finally, finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. They led him away to be crucified. Now he's mocked in front of the world. Mocked and taunted by the public. You know, it's one thing to have the people in the business, the insiders, they say these bad things about you, and then the report gets out and it's in the newspaper. And now people who have nothing to do with the situation, all of the outsiders, they're looking at this and they're pointing fingers. They're saying what a bad man Jesus is. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon who was from Serene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They went out to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall. When he had tasted it, he refused to drink. Obviously, he's super thirsty, and so they give him something really bitter to drink. After they had nailed him to the cross, which obviously is an incredibly painful thing in itself, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Probably not just his clothes, but all of the belongings that he would have had with him. They're taking all of his belongings and redistributing his belongings. Maybe that's a little bit like you've been found guilty and the sheriff rocks up and he takes your house and your car and he, he starts selling the little bit that you have. He sells off and he gives away. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. He's most likely naked at this time. The pictures, the stories we see, there's normally a little cl cloth hanging, uh, hanging over his abdomen, but he would most likely have been naked. Publicly shamed. Everyone walking past is pointing fingers and laughing at him. At noon, we read a little bit earlier, about a sixth hour. So now this day started at sunset. It's carried on through the night. He's been awake. He hasn't slept. Now we're at noon. Darkness falls across the whole land until three o'clock. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And in the midst of this place where he is, it feels like his father, God, has abandoned him. He is alone completely. His friends have gone. They've betrayed him. His one hope that he had left in the natural was the father and the Father has abandoned him. Don't have time to get into all of that now, but he did abandon him because he needed to bring a separation between sin and God. There needed to be judgment. But here is Jesus, just looking at him from a natural point of view, a man completely alone, handed over, has no defense. And then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. Rocks split apart and tombs opened. And then this bit I put in here just because it's one of those rather weird pieces. There's other weird pieces we I don't think we fully get, but if we did, it would just be even more weird. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. That's a weird moment right there. 
So the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake, the darkness first, and the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the son of God. But now it's too late. Now suddenly people begin to realize he was right all along. But it's too late. As evening approached, Joseph, we read this a little bit from Luke as well, a rich man named a rich man from Arimathea who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Carved out of the rock. And then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. He's dead and he's buried. And if you've ever been in that moment where a situation, a circumstance, you felt, I am dead and buried. It's finished. Then the next day, so now he dies at about 3 o'clock. He gets buried, and then the ladies want to go, and they want to embalm him. But by the time they finish getting all the embalming stuff ready, it's already past sunset. So the next day has started. So they can't go and embalm him. But the next day, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. They said, Sir, we remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worth, worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. See, not only is he dead and buried the tomb is sealed. It is finished. There is a full stop. This is the end. The story is over. I don't know when last you were in that moment where you had a bad day. This was a very bad day for Jesus. Maybe your bad day was a bad week or a bad month, a bad six months, a bad year, a where stuff just piled up and it grew worse and worse and worse. You were all alone. And then that moment came, it's over. It's finished. And just as if it isn't finished enough, the people on the other side make sure it is finished. They seal the grave. Close the docket. Finish the process at work. In the relationship, finished. Nothing coming back here. Going the extra mile to make sure the story is over. Except that it's not. Because Sunday is coming. And so often when we think about Easter, when we think about Passover, we think about Jesus' crucifixion, we think about the resurrection, we think about it in terms of eternity where obviously it has immense value. We are saved from our sin. Jesus paid the full price. We think about it in the existential terms. We think about it in the, the one-day terms. This year as we think about Passover and Easter, I want us to think about it in the this-day term because it matters here too. You see, when Jesus went through this very bad day, he didn't only, even if it was only that, it would have still been more than enough. He went, didn't only go through it for eternity. He went through it for today. And some of us, maybe right now, we're in that moment where it feels like the tomb is sealed and it is finished the story is over, or we've been stuck in there for a while, or kind of we're on this downward trend and we can see where this is going. Today I want to tell you, Sunday is coming. See, Jesus is in this tomb and it is sealed and it's not in here, but maybe this is part of the secret for some of us because between Friday and Sunday is Saturday. In the Jewish culture, the Sabbath. 
What can we do on the Sabbath? Nothing. The day of surrender, the day of handing over. See the difference between Friday and Sunday or the space between Friday and Sunday is Sabbath. It is rest. It is yielding. It is letting go. It is knowing if anyone's got this, God's got this, and if God doesn't have this, it's over anyway. I can't save this. And so there is this day of quiet, the day of rest, the day of nothing in that sense. And then we pick up the story again in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. Now I'm not very good at geology and all of this, but I don't think from my understanding that Jerusalem is on an earthquake belt, crack of the earth type thing. You know, we know parts of California, etc. Big earthquake on Friday. Another big earthquake on Sunday. This is not normal. There was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and I just love this about an angel, and sat on it. Sometimes I think we just have to see the picture a little bit. This angel, he doesn't stand there all high and mighty. He rolls the stone and he grabs a seat. He sat on it. His face shone like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. The gods shook with fear when they saw him. Because remember, the gods are there to protect the people from coming and rolling the stone away. It is sealed. These guys are shaking with fear. They fell into a faint, a dead faint. They're not dead, but they fainted. Then the angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. The story is not over. The full stop that you thought a full stop was not a full stop. It is not finished. There is a to be continued. There is a season two coming. There is more to the story. Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I've told you. The woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. One of the other texts, the wording is used so beautifully. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He is not here. He is risen. And here we see the beauty of Resurrection Sunday, that Jesus stood up, defeated death and everything that it holds. But not only did He defeat it in an eternal sense, He defeated it in a sense that He has come to rescue us. Watch what Hebrews chapter 4 says about this. And if the guys at the back, we have the communion elements. If you can stand, start handing out the communion elements for us. Having said all of that, thinking about perhaps Jesus' worst day, not perhaps, almost certainly, Jesus' worst day on this earth starts with a meal with his friends, ends alone with no one around him except his mother and Mary. At the cross. Having been through everything in between, we read that he is our high priest. And in Hebrews, he's telling us about this high priest, Jesus, and why he can relate to us and why we can relate to him. We see these beautiful verses from verse 14 to 16. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe, this high priest of ours 
understands our weaknesses. For He faced all of the same testings we do, yet He did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Perhaps this year, you guys can hand that out, please. This year, as we're thinking about Passover, as we're thinking about Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, as we're thinking about His sacrifice, as we're thinking about His suffering, use it as a moment to realize that whatever I'm going through, Jesus understands. He has been through it and worse. My confusion, my hurt, my pain, my aloneness, my injustice, my sense of just conspiracy against me, whatever it is, He's been through it. And so you can come to Him because He understands. You can bring your hurt, your pain, your confusion. Maybe for some of us, we're going through that right now. Maybe some of us, our day will be tomorrow. I hope not, but maybe we're in a broken world. Or next week, or next month, or next year. Whenever we find ourselves in that place where we feel like it's going pear-shaped, let's have this written in our hearts that we can go to Jesus. He knows. Whatever we're going through, He's gone through. Whatever we're suffering, He's suffered. Whatever we're carrying, He has carried. And we can come and find grace with Him in our time of need. And perhaps the key between Friday and Sunday is remembering Saturday. Finding rest, God's got this. Maybe we need to go through the emotional turmoil. Maybe we're sweating blood. Maybe we feel like we need to pray, and as we're praying, it's like our prayers aren't getting answered, and everyone who I'm asking to pray with me, they're just falling asleep anyway. They said they were going to be there for me, and now the purple's in the fan, and there's no one close to me. They all say they don't even know who I am. Jesus has been there. He's heard the false accusations. He hasn't only been accused falsely. He was condemned falsely. The evidence was there for him to be freed. The evidence was ignored. The message came, do nothing with this innocent man. It was ignored. He was crucified. And the one thing that happened to him, that will never happen to you because it happened to him, is his father left him. He carried that so that you and I can know He will never leave us because He's carried our sin. The judgment has been meted out. And so today as we're about to celebrate His death and His resurrection, we're going to do what Him and His disciples did. They had a meal together. He took the bread. He broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. And then He took the wine and He said, this is my blood shed for you. Perhaps as we do that this morning, we're doing that for a little bit more for our today than we'd realized coming in here. Maybe there's that moment where we need to trust Jesus, cast our hope and our faith upon Jesus, ask Jesus to come and carry us because we can't carry ourselves, knowing He understands what we're going through. He has been there. He wasn't there. Thank you. He wasn't there in its capacity as a perfect God. He was in there as his capacity as a human, suffering in the same way we suffered, carrying in the same way that we have to carry. So this morning, as we remember Resurrection Sunday, let's trust the Holy Spirit to write on our hearts, Sunday is coming. 
Wherever we find ourselves, Sunday is coming. Resurrection is coming. Hope is coming. Joy is coming. Life is coming. Redemption is coming. Even if the enemy is coming to kill and to steal, we're going to have life in Jesus. Can we stand? If you've received the elements, can we stand? If you haven't yet, you can stay seated and our team will come to you. Maybe before I I pray for us, I want to invite you just there where you're standing. If there's something that you're going through that you need Jesus to understand. Perhaps you've never thought that he could understand. or He hasn't gone through what you're going through and he hasn't experienced what you've experienced. Don't you want to take a moment and just bring that before him? Say, Jesus, today I, I see that you've been where I am. You know what this feels like. I'm not alone in this. Just as you're standing, don't you want to take a moment and if that's you, just bring that before him. The scripture says, come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. He understands our weaknesses. He's been through it and worse. So, Jesus, we are so thankful for resurrection, Lord. Jesus, thank you that the story didn't end when everyone else thought it was going to end, Lord. When the world said it is finished, the book is closed, the DVD is ended. You said, not yet, Lord. Thank you that you said that for eternity, Lord. But you're saying it over our lives today. And so today, we want to receive your word that Sunday is coming. The story is not finished. It is not the end yet. It looks like it's the end. Everyone around us tells it it's the end. Except Jesus, it's not the end. So we just receive that, Lord. And we thank you that it's your death that made it possible, Lord, that whatever we're going through, you've been through. And you understand. And so this morning, we eat of the bread, which is your body, broken for us, so that we can be made whole. Let's eat together. And in the same way, Lord, it's your blood was shed for us for every single one of our sins to be washed away. I just want to say to somebody here this morning, there is no sin in your life or anybody else's life that is stronger than the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter how big it may seem to you, how huge it may look, how bad it may sound how strong you may experience it, the blood of Jesus is bigger and stronger and more powerful and can wash it away. And so, Jesus, thank you for your blood, which washes away every single sin. Lord, we acknowledge even this evening, this morning, Lord, that sometimes it's not even false accusations. Lord, the accusations are real in our case, Lord. They don't need to look for witnesses to make up stories. They can just put the facts. We're guilty, Lord. Lord, you went through it innocent, and sometimes we're in it guilty. But even there, you made a way because you paid the price, Lord. And this morning, 
Jesus, we want to thank you for your blood, which washes away every single one of our sins, Lord. Thank you for complete redemption, cleansing, purification, not because we're so clever or we've done these great things, but because of what you did, Jesus. You were the lamb upon the throne. Let's drink together. Thank you, Jesus. As we close, the band is going to continue to minister. If you want to just stay in the Lord's presence for a moment, you're welcome to do that. If you're here and you've sensed God's been stirring in your heart and you want someone just to pray with you, we want to do that. Perhaps you're here this morning and as we were speaking, you realized you've never had a moment where you've accepted what Jesus did on the cross for your life. You've never allowed it to become personal. It's always been somewhere out there and for someone else, but it's stirring in your heart today that you want to receive what Jesus did as a gift in your life. If that's you, we would love to pray with you. It can be no better moment for us this day, for you this day, than to say yes to Jesus. If you're here and you're going through stuff, you want to bring things before Jesus. Maybe you feel like you're in the press and everything, just your day is just going from bad to worse. And you need hope. You can't see that Sunday is coming. You just want someone to pray with you, to agree, to say, but that Sunday is coming. The light of Jesus is going to shine again. There will be great joy. Just to pray with you in that, we would love to do that. So if you need prayer this morning, as the rest step out, I want to ask you, don't you want to just step forward? And we would love to pray with you. God bless you. Have a fantastic day, Father, further today and tomorrow. Enjoy it with loved ones and friends. And may God breathe goodness over your day and week ahead. Amen. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.